I started another YouTube channel. You may have noticed that recently my content has been getting longer as I've been uploading talks and debates and podcasts, and I recognize that not everyone has the time for this, so I started a clips channel, taking the best bits from my longer videos and appearances elsewhere and uploading them as individual, much shorter videos. The link is in the description to the new channel. Please help me reach 25,000 subscribers by Christmas. Hey guys, it's Cosmic Skeptic, and if my experience with arguing about philosophy online has taught me anything, it's that despite this video only having started a few seconds ago, there will be at least one person out there who thinks I've already committed a logical fallacy in one way or another. I can't remember the last time that I put out a video or a tweet or an Instagram reel without at least one person saying that I'm straw manning somebody or committing an ad hominem or an appeal to emotion. And I'm sure that sometimes I do use fallacious reasoning. Of course, we all do. We all make mistakes. But these terms are thrown around so wildly and freely that I actually see them being used more incorrectly, I think, than I see them being used correctly, especially online. So I wanted to take a moment to talk through them and explain how I see people consistently using them wrong. Now, weirdly, and this was seriously uncanny, I had the idea to make a video called Stop Misusing Logical Fallacies quite a while ago. But just before I began scripting it, I found out that a channel called Professor Dave Explains made a video just three months ago with that exact same title, and two of the three fallacies he talks about are also ones I planned to go over. It genuinely freaked me out a little bit, and it was a complete and somewhat devastating coincidence, but I'm glad I saw it. It's a great video, and you should all go and watch it. I'll link it in the description, but I just wanted to note that for anyone who saw his video on the same subject and thinks that I'm just ripping him off or something, I've adapted this whole video to make sure that the points that I'm making are unique to me. Stop misusing the straw man fallacy. It's not even accurate to call this a logical fallacy at all, by the way, since it's an informal fallacy rather than a logical one. Logical fallacies occur when there is an invalidity in the logical structure of an argument, regardless of its content. Informal fallacies occur when there's a problem with the content of the argument. Someone's argument could be perfectly logically valid, but still informally fallacious because the premises are unsound or a misrepresentation. And that's what a straw man is a misrepresentation of your opponent's argument in order to make it easier to defeat. The reason it's called a straw man fallacy is because it provides imagery of someone fighting a man made out of straw, a fake man, instead of a real man. And the fallacy occurs when someone is fighting against a fake position that their opponent doesn't actually hold. As Professor Dave explains, straw man is not simply something you can say when your opponent makes a bad argument. Right? They have to have actually gotten your argument wrong or misrepresented it whilst trying to argue against it. Now, I would also say that there is an implicit understanding that the person does this intentionally, right? If I intentionally misrepresent an opponent's position by saying, for instance, all Christians believe that the Bible was written by God, but God didn't write the Bible, so Christianity is false, I've committed the straw man fallacy, since it's not true that all Christians believe the Bible was written by God. And I know this, that's not the Christian position. But maybe it's just easier for me to argue against this idea of God somehow writing a book. Maybe that's just easier for me to argue against than the real Christian position. So I might claim that this is the Christian position in order to make it easier for me to argue against. This would be a straw man. But I can also do this unintentionally. For instance, if I used to be a biblical literalist and genuinely didn't realize that most Christians think the Bible isn't written by God, I might mistakenly misrepresent the Christian position. Now, technically, you can still call this a straw man, since I'm arguing against a distortion of the Christian position. But if it was a genuine mistake, and not just an attempt to make things easier for myself, I don't think it's too helpful to accuse people of committing the fallacy, which usually has the implication that it's being done on purpose to make the argument easier to defeat. But you can still say something like, you're straw manning my position. Just recognize that your opponent isn't always doing this on purpose. It could be a genuine mistake. But here's another way in which I've seen this fallacy misused. Sometimes I've pointed out that if someone believes one thing, that should lead them to another belief, which they claim they don't hold. For instance, if someone says, I care about all animals, but I don't care about dogs, I might say, well, no, if you claim you care about all animals, then you're claiming to care about dogs, since a dog is a type of animal. And they might respond, I just told you I don't care about dogs. You're straw manning me by saying that I do. That's not my position. Right? Now, obviously, it's not straw manning someone to point out that the implications of a belief that they hold might include another belief, 
that they claim not to hold. Right, I'll give you a real-life example to tell you what I'm talking about. After I posted a video about veganism, claiming that we don't have the right to harm an animal for the sake of taste pleasure, someone tweeted the following to me. Admittedly, you do straw man the omnivorous side of the fence. There are other options for nutrition, sure, but that doesn't mean it all comes down to only taste, as you continuously say it does. If you want to be taken seriously, steel man the opposing argument instead. So this person thinks that I'm straw manning the meat eater's position by claiming that the only justification they have for eating meat is taste pleasure. Their position is actually that it's about getting proper nutrition as well. So when I say it's only about taste pleasure for them, I'm straw manning them. But this isn't what's happened at all, right? My reasoning is as follows. Let's say that you think your justification for eating meat is taste pleasure and nutrition. Right? I make the point that it's perfectly possible to get the exact same nutrients without eating animals. And so you can't justify eating animals by saying you need the nutrients because you can get the nutrients elsewhere. Right? The only thing that you can genuinely not get anywhere else is the way the animal products taste. So that's the only thing that can justify needing to eat animals specifically and not some vegan alternative. So take stock of what's happened here. The meat eater says, I eat meat for nutrition. I respond by saying, you can get the nutrition elsewhere. The only thing that you can't get elsewhere is the way it tastes, which isn't a good enough justification to harm an animal. And the meat eater responds, you're straw manning me, right? I just told you that it's not about taste for me, but nutrition as well. No, I, I haven't straw manned you by understanding your position, representing it correctly, and showing why what you claim to believe is false. This would be like someone saying, I believe in God because I took LSD once and spoke to him. And me responding, well, no, you, you probably believe in God because you hallucinated hearing his voice due to the effects of the drug. Imagine the believer responding, you're straw manning me. My position is that I spoke to God, not that I hallucinated his voice. That's not what a straw man is. Just because I think your position is faulty, don't think that this automatically means I've misunderstood or misrepresented it. Stop misusing the ad hominem fallacy. This is one of my favorites. Ad hominem is short for argumentum ad hominem, which is Latin for argument against the person. And this fallacy is committed when instead of responding to your opponent's argument, you instead attack their personal characteristics in order to undermine their argument in the eyes of an audience. Now that last part is crucial. It has to be an attack on someone's character in order to undermine an argument. Merely attacking someone's character in isolation is not an example of the ad hominem fallacy. As Professor Dave also points out, an insult is not in and of itself a logical fallacy. As an example, if my friend Max puts forward an argument for the existence of God, say due to the apparent fine-tuning of the universe for life or something, imagine I were to respond by saying, Max, you're a liar and a fraud and a bad philosopher, so your argument must be wrong. This would be an example of the ad hominem fallacy, specifically because I haven't just called Max a fraud, that's just an insult, I've said that his argument is wrong because he's a fraud. But this obviously doesn't follow. Someone who is usually a liar and a fraud is still capable of putting forward a sound, valid argument, and that's why it's fallacious. Crucially, though, the way this is usually used incorrectly is people assuming that any time someone insults an opponent, it's a fallacy. And this simply isn't true. It's only a fallacy if the insult is used to undermine an argument. Just calling someone an asshole out of the blue might be rude or inaccurate, but it's not a logical fallacy. Saying you're stupid, therefore you're wrong, is to commit the ad hominem fallacy. But saying you're wrong, therefore you're stupid, is not. Stop misusing the appeal to emotion fallacy. And this has become particularly apparent to me since I started promoting veganism. People often accuse me of an appeal to emotion because I talk about the fact that non-human animals have emotions that need to be morally considered. But that's not what the fallacy is. The appeal to emotion fallacy occurs when, instead of providing a proper argument in favor of my position, I just say something that will spark an emotional response in you to get you to agree with me that way instead. For example, if I were to say, hey, you should stop eating animals because look at this picture of a cute pig, look at this video of a cow crying, it's so horrible and sad to kill them, we really need to stop this. Yeah, that would be an appeal to emotion. I'm trying to convince you, not by providing some valid philosophical argument, 
but by trying to evoke an emotional reaction in you instead. But the fallacy does not occur simply because someone talks about the emotional states of people or animals. Right? I can make a rational argument that bases morality on pleasure and pain that says something like, premise one, any being capable of suffering has moral worth. Premise two, cows are capable of suffering. Conclusion, therefore cows have moral worth. This is a perfectly valid and, I believe, sound argument. Now, someone might be tempted to say, you're just appealing to emotion, talking about how cows are capable of suffering just to try to make us feel bad and feel sorry for them. But no, that's not what I did. You can be completely emotionally uninvested in the suffering of cows, but still accept that the argument is ethically sound. The mere fact that I mentioned the existence of a cow's emotions is not itself an appeal to emotion fallacy. Right. Similarly, if I argued that pro-lifers need to consider the emotional impact on a woman who was raped being forced to bear a child, it's not an appeal to emotion fallacy. Right. I'm not saying, oh, think of the poor women. I'm saying that ethics needs to be an analysis of what causes suffering, and emotional distress is a form of suffering. Right. Simply mentioning the existence of emotions and using this observation in an argument is not a fallacy. It's only fallacious if I'm using the emotional connotations of these concepts to try to win you over, rather than relying on the validity of the argument that uses these concepts. Here's another way that the appeal to emotion fallacy gets misused, this time using a real-life example, again from Twitter. It came at the end of a lengthy argument, but we were talking about people who call animal slaughter murder. I said, I can't deny that if you define murder as the taking of innocent life without good reason, then those who eat meat for taste pleasure alone are supporting murder. But I've never gone around pointing at people and calling them murderers. As you say, that's not helpful at all. So I'm saying that if for someone murder is literally defined simply as the taking of innocent life without good reason, then taking an innocent animal's life without good reason would technically be murder. But I myself think that this is an unhelpful label to use. Here's the response. Well, here's the thing, Alex. The fact that you're using the word innocent in front of the word life is an example of appeal to emotion. It's one of the reasons why people ignore you. I repeat, I do not dislike you or your stance. It's your rhetoric that is what turns me off. So I'm committing an appeal to emotion because I defined murder as the taking of innocent life. Innocent life. The word innocent is obviously just a tool that I'm using to get an emotional response out of you, right? No. Right. I was using the word innocent because it changes the ethical situation if someone is innocent or guilty. Right. This is another example of someone hearing a word that sounds like it could have some emotional baggage, innocent, and immediately assuming that the only reason it's being used is for emotional reasons. But that's simply not what's happened here. Right. Imagine that instead of talking about murder, we're talking about false imprisonment. Right, and I say that false imprisonment is defined as the imprisonment of an innocent person. Now, this tweeter might say that I'm committing an appeal to emotion because I use the word innocent in front of the word person. But the word is necessary to the definition. Right? Without the word innocent, false imprisonment would just be defined as the imprisonment of a person. Right? And that would mean that all instances of imprisonment were false imprisonment, which is ridiculous. No, you need the word innocent to differentiate what it is that makes it false imprisonment. I'm not using the word innocent just to say, oh, look at the poor innocent man in prison or something like that. I'm saying that the prisoner being innocent is literally a part of the definition of false imprisonment. I need to use the words innocent person, not because I'm trying to tug on your heartstrings, but because it's a necessary part of the definition that I'm talking about. Here's the takeaway, right? When you're arguing with someone, sometimes words like innocent can indeed be used just as an emotional appeal. But don't assume that any time someone uses a word that has some kind of emotional connotations, that they're being fallacious. And don't assume that just because someone is talking about someone's emotional state, it's an appeal to emotion fallacy. The fallacy occurs when I play on your emotions to get you to agree with me, not just any time emotional concepts are mentioned in an argument, right? Me arguing that we shouldn't imprison innocent people is not an appeal to emotion. Now, of course, none of this is to say that I myself have never used fallacies wrong or that I won't do so in the future. It's really easy to make mistakes with this kind of stuff. But it's just worth thinking twice when you accuse people of using these fallacies 
and making sure that they've actually committed them. Right? Identifying fallacies is a fantastic way to undermine an invalid argument, but if overused and used incorrectly, they lose their strength as a tool to use in debates, because people just don't take them seriously. But anyway, without appealing to your emotions, let me now appeal to your wallets by reminding you that everything I do is supported by you on Patreon, and a special thanks as always to my top tier patrons. If you want to support the channel, as well as getting to vote on upcoming video topics, among other things, please click the link in the description to find out more. But with that said, I've been Alex O'Connor, or Cosmic Skeptic. You can find me on social media here. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, including to the new channel, Cosmic Clips. Uh, thank you for watching, as always, and I'll see you in the next one.